Hello, my name is Elliot Ward, addiction expert, and welcome to Coming Clean With Me. And in the studio joining me today are Debs Mason and Katrina Roberts. Now, let me just give you a little context of Debs and Katrina, because I had a client of mine come in on one of my podcasts quite a while back. His name is Dan Mason. So let me give you a little bit of context about Dan. Dan was a heating engineer, and he developed a habit over multiple years. And you'll be able to go back and listen to the podcast, because I'm going to put it out on this platform. But basically, he got to a point where he was using up to 65 tickets a week. He had a £1,000 a week cocaine habit, right? That's a £1,000 a week he spent on the packet. And he tried various methods of trying to stop. He'd been to rehab, but didn't successfully get in through the door because it wasn't fit for him. He tried meetings. It wasn't for him. And basically, he came to see me. It's 165 days ago, and Dan's 165 days clean. And I thought it would make a great angle and a different context for your viewers to actually speak and talk to Dan's mum and Dan's sister. So I've got them in the studio today and to ask them some questions to understand what it's like from their perspective. So, Debbie and cool, Katrina, here we go, getting it right now. Yes. Um, welcome, thank you for coming in today. How are you guys doing? Okay, yeah, okay. good, thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So let's just dive straight in, right? So, you know, it's an interesting aspect, being a mum and a sister of someone who has an addiction. You know, and we take you right back to that day when you first started to realise um, how did you first know Dan had a problem? I suppose with me, I was very naive and I didn't know it for a long time. Um, and obviously it had been going on for many years before I became aware of how bad the problem was. Um, I don't know, you probably knew more than what I did. Um, I think for me, initially, when Dan went to Ibiza with some friends of his, um, he was at what? teenager i think um no how old do you think that was i think were? probably about 18 19 okay. and i knew that he had dabbled at that point and i was thinking oh no um you know everyone goes to ibiza there's that stereotype of people having to you know that, that peer, fucking party that time, peer right? pressure um so when he came back he told me something that he got up to over there and i just thought oh you know from there it's it could be downhill um but he was never he was always really sensible out, out of the two of us growing up i was probably more of the rebel from like 14 15 right and he was really sensible workaholic um you're, you're and, older or younger than dad i'm older than i'm three and a half years older than okay. him and i think i never saw it coming with him never saw it coming until he was about 21 Right. And um, I was living away at the time, and when I came back, there was a there was a night that we went out together and an episode, and I thought I, I still didn't even realise then that drug he, he was using that. Night. He was using. Right. Um, I thought there was a lot of mental health, but I didn't really understand that there was a problem with drugs at that point. But but you know you're the same sort of age bracket as Dan. There's only three years between you. Yeah. Whereas your mum's a lot older generation. No disrespect there. No, no, no. It's fine. Which means that you're around the signs of seeing people use a lot more, right, Deb? Deb yeah. Katrina, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. I I knew the signs, but um, at that point in my life, I had moved away to Scotland, um, so I wasn't seeing him as often to understand. I, well, we just thought he had a, a mental breakdown at Is that time. Is that what you thought? Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. going to call you mum and sis. It's yeah. just going to be easier. Yeah. yeah. No, we just thought he'd had, you know, he was going through uh, one hell of a crisis then and, and we actually got the mental health team involved. That that was your first, you know, uh, awakening, it, if you like. Not to drugs. I, right. Then I was still very naive. Yeah. You know, I wasn't brought up with it, wasn't brought up around it, didn't know about it, you know, so I we, we just put it down to mental health And issues. to put this in context, I know where you live. Just share with the listeners where, you know, where, not your house number, but where you live. You <laughs> we know, live so. on a small island, West Mersey. We live on um, Mersey Island, so it's just a small, small community. So it's very clicky, right? Yeah, yeah very yeah. clicky. Yeah. Essex community, everybody knows your business. business yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Most of us are Everyone's family. got something <laughs> to say. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. wondering, sis, like... Going out with your brother just on those rare occasions that you did come back, 
and you you could see that he'd been using. Did you think, oh, well, it's just a social thing? He's just doing it with everybody else. Al, did you think it wasn't a problem, or how did you how did you look at that? Um, no, because it was only one occasion that we had gone out. So okay. that that po- that point when I had come back from Scotland, um, we were going to a nightclub together when he was twenty one, and we were in the queue for it, and all of a sudden he just was becoming very anxious um, and walked away and he walked for miles and I had to call my mum to come and talk and help because he went over a building site he went over to a building site he was acting really odd right um, I didn't really know what was going on but I did think oh maybe he'd taken a pill or something like that and he okay. was you know coming up coming from up. that oh you sound like you um, know what you're talking about well okay listen I'm not as a judge <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think that, um, you've thrown me now. <laughs> uh, I like to do that. I like to put the spanner in the words. This is about being honest, you know, go on. Um, that, that's what I thought in my head initially that he was maybe coming up from a, a pill. Yeah. Um, he was struggling a little bit yeah. or was becoming really, really anxious. And Agitated. I didn't really know what to do with that sort of behavior because well, we didn't, I was because... on my own with him. And okay. was... Let's fast forward a little bit. So now you get to this point where you recognise that Dan has this 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 challenge, this issue, this addiction. You know, what was it for you, Mum, that opened up your eyes to realise that wow, my son does have a an addiction. I'm going to call it the packet because there's so, so, certain social media streams that don't let you use the word. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so what was it that opened your eyes up to realise that you had a problem with the packet? I d I didn't really, really um see it until he bought his second house and that was being done up. How old is he at this point? Oh, this was only what, five, six years ago. Okay, so he's been using for a long time up to this point. Yeah. His 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 usage has gone from social infrequently to going out more often, to a Friday, to a Saturday, to a Tuesday, to a Wednesday, to a Monday. So now this is only five years ago from now. That's when reality kicked in. Go on, what did that look like for you? Uh, Horrendous, absolutely horrendous. Um, His behaviour was absolutely uh, erratic. Um, Give me an example of something that you remember. Oh, phone calls all night long, um, wanting money, demanding money. Um, turning up at the house when I was at bed, um, wanting money. Um, and at that time, you are so drained by it. Um, you just give him money to shut him up, you know. Did but you know the, what you were giving him money for? At that time, then yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you don't... You know afterwards it's the wrong thing to do. At that time, when you haven't got the knowledge about it... Yeah. Um you do what you think is right at the time. Yeah, I but mean, it wasn't. It certainly wasn't. Okay. It was you know, it's on. an interesting thing, Mum, when you say, you know, you give him money at the time, but it wasn't the right thing and maybe you shouldn't have done that. But, you know, listen, we can all look back at certain things that we do in retrospect and, you know, history is a, is a, is a wonderful thing of being able to see things in a different light. And people ask me this often. They say, you know, what do you do with a loved one who has an addiction? Do you do you use the stick and beat them and try and you know beat them into stop using and not using, or do you use the carrot and encourage them? Well, I you know I had sort of like Katrina and, and a lot of people around me sort of saying you've just stopped giving him any money, stop giving him any money, and at the end of the day he was my son, yeah. And you thought what you were doing at that time was the right thing, um, and then you had to realise that it wasn't, you know, and you had to stop. Okay. You know. And I think sorry, not only that that you thought maybe it was the right thing to do but there were times where she's been scared of him oh yeah because his behavior was irrational the the, the behavior uh the erraticness the manipulation that there are times when you've been scared about yeah and i and i have become all very anxious yeah anxious but i can't i became the target okay of the um to blame someone to blame other than himself yeah yeah than what he was going through um it was easy and to blame me it was my fault that i didn't get them out of the situation when they were kids and it was my fault um that he's like he is Hmm. um it's 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 much easier to fire out ammunition outwardly than it is to fire it inwardly Mm. you sound like you're quite strong sis 
because yeah. you were the one that said to mum, you know, you've got to stop giving him money. Yeah, but yeah. I'm like that. It's black and white. I think just cut it out. Okay. Just, I, I, yeah, I suppose we've been through a lot and it has made me a strong person. Um, and yeah, I'm just. How, like how did really. you feel? I mean, because, listen, you have an allegiance to your mother, but you also, also have a love to your brother, you know, undoubtedly. So, what was that like for you when you realised that my brother's like. Lying to the family, because every addict lies. They lie about their own usage, they lie to other people, they lie their quantity, the frequency. They're in denial, complete denial, right? Mm. So they're lying to themselves, and they're lying to everyone else. They're making excuses for any rationale to be able to go and use, right? And it's hurtful to see your mum having phone calls early hours, you know, give me money, give me money, so you can go and score. And that's hard for you, but it's also hard having your brother who has an addiction. What, what was that? that emotion port like for you it's um it's been really difficult um say when when mum was saying about um dan having his house building his you know he had his first house at the time i'd just met my husband and had my son and that I, I couldn't work out why he was trying to keep me away at the time he didn't really want to know me um he was pushing me away he didn't want to meet my husband he didn't really get to know my son for the first few years of his life. Um, I couldn't really work out why. I th I never got an explanation as to what I've done at that point. Um, you blamed yourself or, by the sound of it. Yeah, so I took a, look, a lot of like blame on myself and questioned myself constantly. Like, what, what have I done to deserve this sort of behaviour? You know, you're pushing me away. What is it I've, I've done? I don't know. Sure. Um, and that was hurtful, especially when I had Mia, who's my oldest, and, and my son as well at that point. Um, and, you know, he didn't come to my wedding. He didn't uh, come to your wedding? No, he wasn't invited. Okay. I didn't invite him. So there was like a um, huge ship family rift because, because of this. There, huge... Yeah, there was a rift. And okay. no explanation as to why that went on really in the beginning. So, so his habit and his usage had detached himself from the family that's what you're telling I me. I think he was keeping himself Self away isolated. Yeah. 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 Maybe just trying to hide it. I don't know. Embarrassment, guilt, shame. Yeah, maybe. And, you know, that's the thing about somebody who has an addiction. You know, it's this antisocial drug that it eventually becomes that you just want to hide away, be on your own and use. Hmm. So he's shutting himself off. He's narrowing down his life, you know, because I'm sure there's a part of him who wanted to be a great uncle. Yeah. Yeah. Right? He was always a great uncle to my, my oldest in the okay. first few years. The first few years were brilliant and up until she was about three. That's when yeah. I met my husband. and That's when uh, the habit really kicked in? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think so. But he wasn't he wasn't living at home then. He was living, you know, he'd got his own place. You yeah. Know, you know, he's always been successful in that sense. He's yeah. always worked, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. 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 He's never let his addiction stop him from working he might have missed yeah. the odd day not going in feeling rough going on benders mm. but part of his core value was to go to work yeah. he worked that's a lot how hours. he was brought he you know he was brought up that he had to work to work you know that's how i was brought up and they they learned from me sort of thing that they've they've had to work sort of like did you blame yourself um yes very much so very much so you know you think you know you should have done differently when when they were younger to get the work out of the situation that we were living in at home with his father was a, a chronic alcoholic or a binge alcoholic shall i say his dad was a binge alcoholic yeah and you blame yourself for not allowing getting him to be in that situation for longer than you anticipated yeah because you don't when the kids are small you don't have the strength to get them out of that situation and part of me was stubborn because um i'd been married to katrina's dad um, and it cost me to to buy the house off of him when we split up. Sure. And I'll be buggered if I was going to excuse me. Um, you can swear. <laughs> be buggered if I was going to hand it over to to Dan's dad, who'd put absolutely nothing into the house. I get that. Um, and I had to work my backside off to Listen, keep it. With your hand on your heart now, do you really, really think that if you had left him earlier, that Dan would not have ended up with an addiction? Possibly, but I have looked into it and addictions, some addictions, or a lot of addictions, are hereditary. Okay. Um, so whether he would have been in that environment or not, I don't know. But um, my father was a good influence on his, in his life. Um, 
And I think had he have still been around, Dan would have been a totally different person. I mean, I'm going to tell you. Uh, the, I mean, I know Dan because I spent a lot of time one to one with Dan helping him. Um, and I'm incredibly proud, I'm sure you are. We'll come on to all that later. You know, 165 days, that's fucking good. You can swear here, yeah, right? <laughs> and, uh, but I know Dan, I know his core values, right? Beneath the addiction, beneath the bravado, beneath all of the, the, the shield that hides the real person, I know his core values. And I gotta tell you that you should be proud of the person that you brought up, proud of your son, because he does have great core values, right? Mm. What happened was, for whatever particular reason, this addiction took a hold, okay? And when you talk about, when you said earlier, you said, you know, I know it can be a genetic disposition. It can be, right? You know, that's nature and nurture, you know? But I'm gonna tell you this. I have clients in every industry from the heating engineers like Dan to the plasterers to the people in the building industry, right through to people who have incredibly privileged backgrounds, incredibly wealthy families who had everything given to them, who had the perfect <coughs> life, who had the perfect, <coughs> excuse me everybody, but uh, six days in, I didn't want to let everyone down so I'm still here. Who had the perfect life, who had um, you know everything going for them, they still end up with an addiction. So we can't look and say, it's because of this or because of that or because I didn't do this or because I did do this. All you can look at is the core values you installed. What were you gonna say? <laughs> I don't know, got over your head now. Okay, um, how did you find, what about the point when Dan, Dan came clean? Actually, let's go back. What about denial? Because there was a point he was in denial and I'm sure that sis, you would have noticed that more than anyone. I don't think he actually ever came clean, clean. It's just that we found out more and more and more. Okay, like what? Um, I think it's just the more and more behaviours started to show. Give really, me for us. Um, the erratic driving around the village or in, in the town. Because um, he would drive psychosis. Without, without a licence, correct? Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah drug, drug driving. Yeah. Um, you know, he would turn up to come and see me and the kids sometimes and he'd pull up so fast and you'd think, Please, Bike was please always just, loud. Yeah, please just stop. You know, there are kids around the area and you, you try and tell him, you know, slow down and you shouldn't be doing this and shouldn't be doing that. But he didn't want to listen. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask this question to both of you individually, though. Just for a minute, just think. What was the worst time you can remember with Dan specifically? Um, the night of uh, the psychotic episode. Go on, was, tell uh, me about that, what happened. Uh, basically, I, I got a call. I think, I don't know whether he'd phoned me during the day and he was absolutely bizarre. Um, he'd been using all day by the yeah, accounts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and I had a phone call from his friend who was actually at the house at the time. He, he'd been working near there and he said, do you want me to call in? And I said, yes. Um, so he called in and he was uh, in one hell of a state and he said, I think you need to come up here. Um, obviously, living in Mersey and him living in Ipswich, you know, I had to drive up there and this was at night. Um, and I got there and there he was with a baseball bat. Um, baseball bat? Yeah, he was with a baseball bat. He'd been knocking flower heads off. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Sorry. He's been using all day. Yeah. He's got a baseball bat as you turn up. Yeah. He's been knocking well, flower the, heads off. Yeah, he'd st the baseball bat was still there. I was handed that by uh, by his friend. The police were there. Um, he was put in handcuffs. <laughs> it's not funny, really. Uh, no, no, I know. It, it, I know. It, it, um, you have to laugh. Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Um, he, the police then turned up. He was in handcuffs. There was an ambulance there as well. Um, Complete drug psychosis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, with that, um, they were trying to talk to him, calm him down. Obviously, he was on another planet. Yeah. Um, two of his friends turned up um, uh, and wanted to help him as well, wanted to go in the ambulance with him, but they weren't allowed. Um, he was then taken off to hospital, uh, which his mate and I went and followed the ambulance and went there. He was taken into the hospital in handcuffs and we had to wait to, uh, the police were there as well, we had to wait for the doctors and whoever was supposed to be seeing to him. Um, we went into a little room, oh no, the, the police took the handcuffs off him, 
and the staff were absolutely furious because they didn't want the police to go, but the police didn't want to wait around any longer. Are you there at this time? I'm there. I'm there, yeah. I mean, that must be difficult for you because on one hand, you're seeing your son in this psychotic, drug fueled way. And on the other side, you're seeing your son handcuffed, which must be an emotionally disturbing Yeah, because he could, you thing. know, he's got ADHD. Yeah. So for him to sit still is near on... He's a uh, fidgeter. Yeah, oh, crikey, yeah. Um, but um, we went. We were taken into a little room, uh, which me and his mate went in with him, and the doctors came in and spoke to him and then just said, wait here. He saw an opportunity of getting out the back door. So he went out the back door through the emergency department. So the security men followed him. By now, uh, the um, the hospital had taken his capacity away, and we were absolutely relieved because I just thought, right now we're going to get some help. When you mean sectioned, is that what you meant by capacity away? No, they took his mental capacity away from him. Right. Okay. So they said as such. So then, of course, he got out the back door of this little room. You felt relieved at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Because th- finally, we thought we were going to get some help. Yeah, we're like we're here. We're going to someone's going to help us resolve yeah. our son. Yeah. Um, yeah. He went out the back door. Um, there were security men looking for him. They then um, found him. We were at the front of the hospital then where we had two doctors come around and deemed him um, perfectly fine and gave him his capacity back and we can go home now and take him home. Sorry. Well, so you've gone from being in the hospital, police are called, handcuffs, being psychotic, (laughs) still in the hospital. Yeah. Doctors are saying he doesn't have the mental capacity to be safe. Yeah. Him escaping out the back door and two other doctors saying, no, no, he's okay. Yeah. Let him go. Yeah, we got three security there and the two doctors and they just turned around and said, right, we're giving him capacity back. You can take him home. I thought his mate nearly hit the wall and just sort of said, are you not seeing what we're seeing? And they just said, sorry, he's fine. He can go home. And, and that, you took him home at that I point? I took him home at that point. And then they said to him that he could come back if he wished to talk to them. So we went back home, I think it was like three, four in the morning. Yeah. Um, tried to get some rest. Um, within an hour, he was up and right. He said, um, you can take me back to the hospital now. I'll go and talk to him now. And um, so we went back to the hospital and he said, um, that's all right. He said, you can go now, leave me at the hospital. Um, so that must have been so hard for you because now you don't know what to do to help your son. No, because he went back to the hospital God knows what was said then, I don't know to this day, but I then had to come back to Mersey, drive back to Mersey, and within half an hour um, to an hour, um, he turned up in his car again. He's back home. He's back home. He, no, he drove to Mersey then, because right, okay. he's home Zipswich. But, right, but yeah, right. so then he drove to Mersey in his car. Wow. Um, and you just wanted to hit your head against the brick wall because they're, you know... There isn't the help there. Unless you got an exorbitant amount of money, there, there wasn't the help there. Into the private world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But then you look at that and there isn't the after help, I feel. Yeah, that, I mean, I think needed. you're right. I mean, I looked at rehabs for a long time and I've spoken to a lot of people who run rehabs and, you know, listen, I think there are certain things that work for certain people. You always hear me say that. Mm. And I think there are certain things that aren't right for certain people. But I see a lot of rehab clinics, it's just a money-making machine. Mm. The moment you're out the door, there is no follow-up. I I had a discussion with a director of five rehab centres a few months ago, and when I asked him their statistics, his answer was, we don't know. Once they leave, we don't really care. And if they haven't been successful, they didn't really want to do it. Or maybe someone paid for them, they were there for the wrong reasons. Well, when you see all these celebrities and they're in and out the whole time. Oh, yeah. Always, you know, your Katie Prices and, and God knows who else, you know, they're in and out, in and out, and you just think, well, it's not working there, love. Try something different. Like a holiday camp. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so moving on to CIS, what, what for you was the the worst, you know, time you can remember? I think going back to 21, when he was 21, um, knowing that there were suicide attempts mm. for me, I didn't really know how to deal with that properly. Um, and then fast forward a few years later, there was more suicide attempts, seeing him at his new house, um, just so, so broken and, and low, um, and knowing that there's nothing that I could really do. I was giving him letters, um, numbers. Letters? What do you mean? Like writing letters. But what, through, about your feelings? Is that what you mean by letters? Or letters yeah, or? and just get it. I wrote a letter to him, um, went through the front door, um, different numbers to contact for help. Okay. Um, and the thing is that we tried to get help and it's not, you know, 
there were several times we went <coughs> to the hospital. Yeah. You know, he's come off his bike because he'd been taking drugs and I was at the hospital with him and he left and then first thing he did was go and get some more drugs and the help isn't there. You're asking for it. You're going to the doctors. You're phoning different people. But really, it, it, if, to me, it doesn't feel as if it's there. And, and, and when you tried to find some help for Dan and he didn't want to take the help because it wasn't right for him, how disheartening, <laughs> how disheartening for you was that? That was hard. Yeah, it's That's really hard. hard. And we had, um, after several suicide attempts, um, I had the paramedics out at his house. Um, and he just turned around and he said to them, and it was so calmly, he said, please don't waste your time for me. I don't want to be here. Um, there's plenty of other people outside there that you can go and help. You're, you know, I'm just, you're just wasting your time being here with me. And they just turned around and said, because he knows his own thoughts and that's what he wants to do, there was nothing they could do to help him. They stayed there a long time to try and talk to him, but in the end they went. Yeah. Because there's nothing they could do because that's what he said he wanted to do. So every time I came away from that place, you never knew the next day whether he was going to be alive or dead. Mm. And that's many and many a times. You and then just... it starts to affect your own well-being yeah. and your, you know, how you are dealing with things at home you know how did that affect the dynamics of your family sis oh i've got a husband and three children sure. and it's he's put a huge amount of stress on on us and that I cause arguments at home um there have been a couple of arguments at home like for, for one example when we we went away to cornwall we were in the the caravan with the kids <laughs> and my brother was bringing me up constantly in a psychotic episode he's off his tits off his tits basically right. telling me all this random stuff constant calls about what yep. he's gonna do and i'm trying to have a nice time with my children and my yep. husband and yeah it's it's a stress for me of course it affected my well-being definitely and a stress for your husband because at the end of the day he chose to marry you not choose to marry your brother well, yeah, he, he loves my brother, you I'm know. But, I'm not saying he doesn't. Know. What I'm saying is no. everybody has so much patience, right? Yeah. yeah. You're going to have more patience <laughs> because you're emotionally invested more than your husband. I'm not saying he doesn't care. I think what I'm saying is he's a step further than you two are away. And then other family members mm -hmm. are further and further steps back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, he's definitely seen the backlash of it. Say if I was, if I had been back to my mum's and my brother's there at the time and they've got, I say it's quite toxic relationship. So if I've gone home into that environment and then I've drove back to my home, I'm taking that with me. Of course you are. And it's hard to, to, to chill out sometimes, you know. Oh. It's been been a constant, hasn't it? The, the whole the whole way. It's like stress. He's like a Jekyll and Hyde, or has been like a Jekyll and Hyde. So you don't know what Dan you're going to get coming through the door. And it makes uh, you feel very anxious. anxious. Yeah, yeah. So knowing he's going to come and visit you, you are both feeling anxious at who's going to come through the door. Yeah. Not yeah. necessarily who's going to come through the door. It's about his mood and what mood he's going to be in. Okay. Um, when I say who's coming through the door, what I meant is... Oh, with him. Yeah, with, yeah. with who's going to come through yeah, the door sorry. in terms of... Listen, you're sitting at home and you're expecting your son or your brother to turn up to come visit and you're anxious at which son or which brother is going to come through the door at that moment in time. Is that the one that's been using? Is that the one that's still using? Is that the one that's using last night? Or is this the son and brother that we love, want to be involved in our family and our children and, you know... That's the brother I want and the, the son I want. Yeah. Who's coming I, I think, through the door? I think with, with Dan, he um, because he lost people around him that he needed in his life, like my brother's been a big influence um, and been absolutely brilliant to him. When you say you lost know. the brother, what did you mean by that? No, no, because they took a step back. Okay, so, so there were people who, that were supportive, encouraging, like your brother, his uncle. Yeah, but he's, he's, he was brilliant. You know, he's been absolutely brilliant. You know, he has. Um, but at times, you know, um, it, it was awkward. Um, I must admit, Stephen, my older stepson, um, absolutely brilliant. He made a promise to Dan that he would um, come down every two weeks, drive down from Scotland every two weeks to be here to support him, to help him oh, come well, hang off. Oh, on, hang on, I didn't know that. So Dan's stepbrother... Lived in Scotland. Lives, lives in, Scot in Scotland. Yeah, lives in Scotland. And would drive from Scotland to visit Every two him. weeks. Every two weeks to support him. Yeah. What's his name? Stephen. 
Big shout out to you, Stephen. Much respect. <laughs> well, this is, this is a bit awkward. Oh. It's stepson Stephen. Right. My brother Stephen. Son in law Stephen. <laughs> There's a lot of Stevens there. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so, this, so this is Christmas, Stephen Mason. Did you just write a card <laughs> yeah. to the Stevens? Yeah, yeah, Money. yeah. No, he, because Dan was in a bad way and obviously a uh, suicide attempt, so he drove down next day. As soon as he found out, he drove down the next day. Um, and he drove down every couple of weeks um, to be there for him. Well, then, obviously, Dan's dad died in uh, not the best circumstances, Um so his behaviour escalated. How long ago was that? Two years. So two years ago, Dan's dad passed away. Yeah. And then Dan's behaviour escalated. Yeah. His usage escalated. Yeah. His psychosis escalated. Yep. The side effects from using escalated. So we, <coughs> we had that for um, that year. And then obviously my mum also, while this was going on, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, so I was dealing with her as well. So a lot on your plate um, all of yep. a sudden. And then a year after losing his dad, we lost my mum. So things escalated again because he was um, very close with my mum. Right. So the behaviours then went off the scale again. Listen, I'm going to ask you a question because I'm not Frank as in that phone that you phone and go, hey, phone Frank if you've got a problem. Um, oh, what... I tried that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't bother. <laughs> There you go. But what I'm going to say is this. If you were to be able to talk to somebody who was at the very beginning of Dan's journey, not Dan, let's take Dan out of the equation, right, who started using because they thought it's a cool thing to do on a weekend, it's a social thing, I'm in control. I'm never going to become like that. Mum, what would you turn around and say to them? I don't really know. You know, uh, as a parent, they've got to be there to listen, but... Um not to finance it. <laughs> That's what you can tell the parent? Oh, yeah. Okay. Definitely and not what are you going to tell somebody's... If you're the sister now, and it's not Dan, but you've seen where it took Dan, but you can get in at the early stage when this person is only using socially at the beginning who really doesn't think it's going to escalate to a problem. What are you going to say to them? I would always advise somebody not to do that um, and go down that route as much as I can. Um, only from experience. Um, you can only do so much. That's what I've learned in this situation. But sometimes you can advise, you can try and help as much as possible. But there comes a point where it's not until that they listen. person needs to learn for themselves. How do you think they do that? <sighs> Hitting rock bottom, I suppose. Sometimes you've got um, to hit rock bottom to get back up. Yeah. You thought Dan reached a point and hit rock bottom? Definitely. Yeah. I, oh, I didn't think he would... I didn't think that he would still be here now. No, no. Every day, I think we were all waiting for a phone call to say he, he'd either taken his own life or he'd killed himself in the car or the bike or... Or somebody else. Or somebody else. Every day, every day, we were, it was like that. I know that when Dan was on the podcast with me and he said to me that... At one point, it got to the point where, and I don't blame my mum, but my mum called the police on me. Oh, yeah. What was that? Tell me about that, mum. That night, oh, God. He was driving like a erratic, God knows what. Um, we just didn't know where he was. I was on the phone to Stephen, his, steps, his um, brother, um, and he said, I'm sorry, you've got to phone the police. You've got to phone the police. We've got to do it for, for his own safety. Um, so I phoned the police. It's a hard thing to do, though, isn't it's it? It's a hard thing to do, and I had to do it more than once. Um, but I phoned them, and I said he was driving erratically, and God knows where he was. We were knew he was around uh, Ipswich area uh, as such. I think he stopped his car and was looking for his mate under the bloody seat. Excuse my French. Paranoia. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, he was seeing people and God knows what else in the rear view mirror. Um, uh, so I called the police and then I had the police phone me back later on to say they'd been around there and he was at home in bed. So, <laughs> you know. There's, there was no stopping him at there that no, point. There was no stopping him. It, it wouldn't no matter. Stopping. Ruthless. It's just yeah. about him. <laughs> oh, <laughs> selfish. Him and his drug. Yeah. Very and, sorry, selfish. Not seeing the consequences. Beyond being selfish was very... Didn't yeah. see the consequences of his actions. No, no, no. And half the time when you said anything to him, he said he didn't want to be here anyway, so it didn't matter. Nothing else mattered. It. No. So... so then he came to see me, started changing his life about, started making progress, getting clean, putting things in place. What was the first milestone that you, you noticed? What was the first milestone you noticed? Says, 
when your brother's starting to improve and you're getting your brother back? Yeah, just being a little bit more present, um, actually socialising with my children where he just, you know, they'd be around him and he'd blank them. Right. Just n nothing, no acknowledgement at all. Um, so that's really nice. <coughs> that's really nice to see. And just, yeah, just making more of an effort, really. That was the first. <coughs> what was the first things you noticed, Mum? Yeah, being being a little bit more calmer um, and not so aggressive yeah. has been better. You know, he still struggles some days, okay. you know, um, and I'm still mum at the end of the day. So if I tell him off, it's still going to get a little bit of back chat and a little bit of limpiness. Um But yeah, he's he's so much better than what he was. So much better. 165 days. How proud are you of him? Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Do you funny. feel like you got him back now? Getting there, slowly. getting there. Oh, there's a lot of bridges that got burned that need to be rebuilt. There, yeah, there's text. a lot of trust. Yeah, I think there's a lot of trust that's been broken. And Katrina, let me ask you a question. At what point does that person earn the trust back? That's a good question. Um, for me, it's about the behaviors still at the moment. Okay, so there are still some concerns yeah and i think until he learns how to control his feelings a little bit more perhaps he's, it's he gets very much yeah. i think where he gets anxious about a lot of things it can come across as um aggression okay doesn't know sense. quite how to channel his emotions in the right way yet not fully i don't think but okay. that's just my opinion but he's working on it i think so yeah. And you see that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. definitely see that. You know, we'll have a cuddle, you know, if, if we've had words and that now. Um, because obviously it's hard for me to let go. I'm constantly watching. I'm constantly looking what he's doing. He, because of the ADHD, you know, he doesn't sit still and you're forever watching. You're forever looking at his face, um, you know, so that they, it's hard not to sort of like chip, you know, and I shouldn't. That's what I should learn. But... Um, we often, you know, if we've had words, you know, we'll now have a cuddle afterwards and, you know, move forward. You know what so. I get from you? I, I get a real feeling of love from you, Mum. Oh, I love him to bits. Know, he knows that. I do love it's him to bits. It's such a lovely thing. I want to cloud his ear, but I love him to bits. Yeah, but that's part of love, isn't it? That's <laughs> yeah. part of loving your yeah. child. Oh, crikey. Yeah. I like the that. The pair of them are, you know, the bee's knees and my, my three grandchildren are the, oh, the best in the world. That's good. That's <laughs> good. So, um... Listen, I'm going to bring Dan on in a minute, but not yet. But before I do that, as a, as a, as a mum, right, let's just deal with this first. As a mum, what advice would you give to other mums who, whose son or daughter or loved one is going through an addiction? What advice would you give to the parent or the family I member? I think you've got to listen and be there for them um, and, and, and certainly be absolutely listen to them but you've you've got to know when to take a step back and make them realize when they need to get the help um and i don't really know you know it, it's hard because everybody's situation is is different okay. you know it, it's um but when they're feeling like when the parents feel like it's their fault what would you say to them i don't know i still haven't come up with the answer to that for yourself no right? No. That's fair enough. No. I guess I'm going to ask the same question. So for a sister, a brother who has a loved one, who has an addiction, who's still in that addiction, what advice would you give to the brother or the sister of the person who has the addiction? I think just it's just to make sure that you're looking after yourself throughout all of it. I think that's really important to look after your own well-being um, because you can get so absorbed into mm. it and then it starts affecting everything else around you. Yeah. Um, it has such a negative knock-on effect. Um, yes, you can be there for the person with the addiction. You can listen and you can support as much as, as possible. But like mum said, if, if they don't want to listen, they've got to learn for themselves. And that's a hard lesson for an outsider to, to learn. It's true. But it didn't sound like you, either of you ever gave up. Oh, no, I wouldn't have given up. <laughs> never, never given up. You know, we we tried so many different... Um, we looked in, into sort of um, 
different places for him to go to different we've tried some bizarre things you know um put it out there sort of like to him and he's tried different things but it none of them worked for him and it wasn't until he watched your podcast with um no it was uh, uh it was a podcast with um dapper. dapper and kirk right and he said mum watch this and then your name was brought up into it sort of thing and he said what do you think um so i said right give it a go we've given everything else a go you know i was the last resort you was the last resort yeah, and, you worked. <laughs> but you've Thank worked you. and uh i'd never have thought in a million years that uh, something so simple well I, I know it's not simple but you know as such would would actually be his turning point um but it's uh you know i'm forever grateful well you know that I know. um you know, I think I think it's because you are a strong male character, and yeah. that's what he's he always yeah. needed in his life. He never yeah. had that. You, you have that, that um, influence yeah. over him. I think, I think, I think he respects that. I think. Thank you. I think um, one of the things that with my clients is that I am a straight talking, no nonsense, no bullshit. I say it as it is. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't take prisoners <laughs> if you like. So I think that's what you mean, right? Yeah, yeah. and also. Um, after sort of like he's had his you know treatment with you you've not walked away you're there on the phone every week you know you're in constant contact um and that's what he needs yeah i feel that's what he needs um well, and he's that's, that's me. yeah thank you you know it's it's there you know and i just feel like we know you because of through dan sort of thing you know thank so you. Uh, did you just before I'm, I'm, he's itching to come in. I, I know he is. But, uh, <laughs> Katrina, did you ever feel like giving up on him? Yeah, I suppose there were times. Yeah, I had to really. For your own sanity. Uh, yeah, I had to because it was affecting my children and my family. So, of course, I definitely had to take. Listen, you said something earlier that I, I use an analogy for. The captain on the plane says, "If the oxygen mask comes down." You got to put it on yourself first before you start helping other people. Otherwise, you're going to run out of oxygen before you can help anyone else. Yeah, that's also what you say. Come on, Dan. Come on in. Mind the camera if you come in. Yes, yeah, squeeze round. So this is Dan. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, you shimmy past here. Breathing a bit. And uh, as you know, this is Dan's mum and sister. So I just thought I'm going to put Dan on the spotlight so he's actually on camera and. Uh, Come in so closer to the mic, Dan. Like we're in. Perfect. So, uh, listen, we're here, right? And he can't get away. <laughs> and so let's just start with... <coughs> just tell Dan what he's put you through. We'll come to the niceties after. Hell. Go on, Mum. Absolute hell he's put us through. Anything Absolute. more? Yeah. There'd be so much, but I wouldn't want to put it out on air. <laughs> <laughs> you said something earlier, <coughs> Katrina. You said he's still building trust, right? Tell me something. Tell Dan what he has to do more to build that trust with you and your family to cement that. Just keep making himself present, I suppose, and calm. Um, just try and control his emotions a little bit better around my mum and myself. And I think gradually we'll get there, you know. I mean, like, we can all feel like we're losing everything and hitting rock bottom, but, you know, a tree loses its leaves every year and starts over again from rock bottom, doesn't it? Oh. So, no, he's been, like, he's been reading <laughs> those books, hasn't he? You like the old TikTok, don't you? And the, uh, yeah, <laughs> so, like, you know, but, but for, for me, sometimes it feels like, there's only a certain amount of times you're allowed to do that. Or some people won't... You don't want to watch someone go around that circle over and over and over, I understand. Mm. You know? But, um, yeah, you've got to give people chance and <laughs> room to, to, to grow. You know, and it takes time. You know? mm. Yeah, you're still in recovery at the end of the day. I'll always know, be in, in, in recovery, in a, in a recovery yeah. or, or some sort of... <laughs> um, some sort of... Uh, do you find it frustrates... Sorry, one second. Do you find it frustrates when you've made all the progress and you're still not a thousand percent accepted uh yeah you know sometimes it can it just it, you get the sly comments and and stuff and whenever you're doing something or you know you do have a bad day and you do we all get have like long days at work or 
feel a bit rough one morning or anything, but you know, you get tired of the comments. Oh, you were one of them. You were obviously on it last night, weren't you? And if I go down the shop, you just been make your dealer. I go, yeah, I'll make my dealer. So just just to say it because whatever you say, sometimes you feel you, they won't believe you. You know. Sometimes you just think, when is this going to stop? Yeah, yeah, basically. But then from that side of you. They heard it over and over and over and over again after year after year after mm. year. And give them their dues, Dan. They haven't... Listen, no matter what your mum's done in terms of calling the police rightly, wrongly... I'm oh, yeah, don't disagree with any of that. Right? But they've stood by you. Yeah, they're, they're there. They're there. They're there. They're, they do... You know, we can all talk a good part and, and that, but it's... You know, sometimes you've got to... They've, yeah, they... You've got to actually mean that, what you say. Do you, do you know what I mean? And I think that the massive thing with all of us here is uh, actions speak louder than words. What do you uh, mean by that? Um, because of, like, you know, like, how many times do you have you heard me saying that over and over and over before we actually start making progress? And like with yourselves, you know, you say that the comments and that and the little nigglies and the little narcs will stop, but they, they, they sort of don't. But I think it just needs to be like a, a neutral ground of, like, I'm on. Do you say that on board? I, I, I do think that, but I also think that needs to come both ways. That works both ways because... So how, so who who starts making that progress first? I think everybody needs to make an effort. That's a fair ground, and that's a sensible ground. So what do you do, Katrina, I to, think... to start making that better than it is right now? I'm going to tell you what he's going to do well, in a minute because he's going to tell you. But for you're... me, it's probably letting go of the letting go of the past, letting go of what's happened, and just moving forward as much. There's as, a lot of hurt there, right? Yeah, there is a lot of hurt there, and um, I don't think he. I think he still blames me. Blames you? Yeah. Go on. Through you know, like I say, from when he was younger and things like that, because that's what he'll throw at me. Do you? No. What happens here, in my opinion, in my eyes, is that. They're stuck in the past and they can't move forward. <laughs> they really, they really are, and they just can't get past that barrier of okay. we're, we're now making progress, and you're just, just there. And we just need to come forward. No, this is the most interesting thing of all, because 165 days clean, huge progress. We've all given him props, and you can see how years and years of having addiction can cause such deep levels of pain. That even though you all, I can tell you all love yourself, you know, especially, you know, both of you actually, but I really feel it for me because I didn't have a mum, so I actually feel that a lot, to be fair. Um, never had a sister either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Do them cheap if you want. <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it takes a lot to rebuild that, and, I, and I'm starting to hear that even over 165 days, that there's still a lot of work to do, right? Oh, yeah, there's oh, definitely. Yeah. There's On yeah. all sides. Yeah, 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 yeah it is. But, but, you know, but who. Are we going to put a, a date on this, a checkpoint, a certain mark, or, no. or what? No, you know, I, I think... When is it going to, going to sort of come? It needs to be a daily occurrence. Yeah. Uh, what, so see... I've got to ring in and check in each day? No. Yeah. Or vice well, check, versa? check in with yourself before you walk into the house. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that would be a good See, start. the thing about someone with addiction is once they've got over it and once they've had a period of time, they're looking for closure. They're looking mm. to be forgiven, forgotten, moved on. But when you've lived through it yourself, you're looking to go... You still got to prove it to me. You still create a lot of hurt. I can't just quite close that. So you're in slightly different places, mm. and somehow you can't meet together. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. I agree with that because, you know, as you said, it's we're only 165 days in. We had the luxury of coming down to see you at the the live event. Yeah, live with event. You. We dap. We did a live podcast yeah. for those who. Yeah. So that was um, obviously the first time I'd seen you in a little while. And once we were down there, it was in that environment where there was a lot of users there that day, weren't there? Absolutely. A lot of leg tappers and stuff like that. And that's like, that was a hard hard thing to be around, but the, the, because of the event and that, that gave you positivity and that gave you the strength to, to be able to be around it. But So you've always got a bit of self-control with that, but sometimes you're in them situations and that people just assume that you've done wrong because you're in that environment. Do you know what I mean? There's another thing a question of doing wrong. I think it's a question of this. You know, if I was to if I was to sum it up, <coughs> I'd sum it up like this, and I'd say this to you, Mum and Sis, an addiction's a natural thing. And let me explain why. Right? Human nature is about looking for something that gives us some sort of pleasure. Forget what the substance is, whatever it is. And if you find something that gives you pleasure, it's human nature that you want to do it more and more 
and more and more. And when you first start using the packet, you don't see the negative consequence. All you see is the pleasure. By the time you get to this point where it's relieving a, te it's a temporary relief from your problems in life and you have problems, only then do you see that using is more problems, but the actual using was helping you deal with the problems. And you're so far in, it's difficult to get out. And at that point, this natural ability to seek pleasure is detrimental to you because everything you do has become less and less and less, right? Mm. So by that point, for that person who's using, they didn't set out to do this, but you're the family. You went, yeah, but I never created this situation. I never made you do this. I've never not loved you. I've never not been there for you. It's a difficult thing. So now we reach this point where we go, somehow we've got to bridge this and come together because all three of you are very loving. So I'm going to ask you, what would you say to your mum now that she stood by you and been there for you and loved you and supported you? Rightly, she made some right decisions <coughs> and she made some wrong decisions, which she's here to say. Mm -hmm. Right? What would you say Definitely. back to your mum? For everything she's done you don't realize how strong you are and how tough you are and the stuff that we put you through both of us not just just myself and how much we all do do love you and appreciate you thank we, you we, that's we nice do. to hear that Dan. you know actually and to your sister <sighs> <'Cause she's laughs> I'm, not, I'm not i'm not there yet she's got to build up trust mate this is a little bit harder than yeah, I like the, 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 you know she's got uh, she's got to do some proving grounds on her, her behalf you know so no seriously right she's no matter what you've fallen out of the pair of you i get that you've built back together you've kind of you kind of not been there for your nephews as much you're starting to make strides to doing that correct that's probably the yeah that's the biggest thing the thing for my sister with that is the fact of regardless of our differences and damage that have been caused, that never come between the kids and spending time with the kids and stuff like that. And for spending time with my, my, my nieces and nephews is, is, is not most important, really, you know. Um, and that's... A well, she's never shut you out. She's no, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. So then, uh, but uh, going back to at that point when I didn't go to her wedding, I wasn't around for them a few years, it's because it's... You're like, fucked up. Yeah, it's, it's because it's that moral ground, isn't it? You, you don't do this sort of stuff around kids. You, you don't... Do you know what I mean? You don't have. But we're here now, Dan. Right? Yeah. So this is your chance to say, "I didn't go to your wedding. I didn't do all this. What do you want to say to her?" I was off my head. I was away with the fairies. Do you know what I mean? But uh, and I, I, like, this probably, probably one of the saddest things I've actually had to miss out on, really, and probably one of the lowest points, other than asking mum for money. I'd probably say of addiction, definitely. Yeah, because if if I had anybody to walk me down the aisle, it would have been. My brother. Because, oh, you know, don't have a dad. But he's now saying, so, "Sorry, he can't go back." Yeah, no, he we can't, can't go back on that. that. But what um, can he do now to make it tight between the two of you and the kids? I think it's important just to keep talking and being honest. And do you forgive him? Yeah, of course I do. Yeah, we've got, haven't we? We all got. There's got to be a point. And when you're family, yeah. you know, we have some of us has better friends than family. We don't get to always pick them. But yeah, I think forgive Well, let me just tell you something. You've got a fucking family. Yeah, I have. This is the thing. This is the thing. I tell you. You see, I, I, have, I have a different perspective because I don't have a family. You know, my dad oh, was you killed. you can join us. I'm going to be there. Don't <laughs> you worry. Listen, I have... Uh, well, it means I have my own family now, but I didn't grow up. I didn't have a family. My dad was killed when I was very young. My mum was, let's just say, not really a mum. You know, like my mum used to write in her diary... I must remind myself to tell Elliot that I love him tomorrow. And then she'd laugh in my face going, yeah, but I always forgot. And listening to you guys, <laughs> right, is so heartwarming. Because it's the first time I've had a family in together. I've always interviewed clients or people who've had addictions. I've never had a mum and a sister and the person who had the addiction in, in together. So for me, this is quite a, it's a real heartwarming thing because... I didn't have a family. I didn't have anyone supporting me. I didn't have the love that you guys have. But can you, could you... You know, I think it's a bit of an appreciation moment that you need to enjoy as well because of you're listening to the damage and the destruction and all this all the time with people with addictions and their, and their problems and you've seen how much my addiction have destroyed my family, but then this reflects on you to where we're at now is because of what we've had from you and the support and the time you spent with us has brought this all back and this is what has all done this so I'm going to say this at the moment in time yeah. thank you thank very much you. Elliot yeah. World yeah. for what you have yeah. done yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well thank you yeah. so yeah, definitely. 
I think that takes us to conclude. What a beautiful ending. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. I Thank really you very appreciate it. Thank you. And Thank this you. is coming clean with me. Yeah. Thank you. Take Thank care. You. Thank you. Bye.